fun Take your rod and your gun But leave all your troubles at home You'll have no time to fret Out on old Barney Gat When the wind whips for waves into foam She will please and beguile Change your frown to a smile And chase all your cares away Summer Sedley represents one of the finest examples of the sportsman hunter in the United States. He guns in a traditional way, using the Barnegat Bay decoys and a gunning boat known as a sneak bomb. The end is not exactly the means to Summer. It is the preparation and the excellence that he strives for in the quest for the waterfowl. You must remember when you consider Summer Sedley, the deep tradition that he is involved with in his own experience in New Jersey with his father and probably before that, so that he's well versed in those artifacts, the, the sneak box, the Barnegat Bay decoy. So that, from my mind, I don't know what Summers would say, but from my mind, his decoys are memories of those hunts and memories of that tradition and that age as he continued to go out in these uh, hunting enterprises. What's the difference between this bird, for example, and a Shores goose? A uh, Shores is a thicker body. It's more of a, a rounder goose. This is flat bottom. This is a flat bottom bird. And Shores is rounder and deeper and different, different carving characteristics uh, denoting the maker. Summers, do you figure this is a uh, fairly typical Jersey style bird? Oh, I think so. It's a beautiful bird made uh, in the tradition of the Barnegat style. Hollow, light, easily carried. It's not really good for heavy weather, but for a protected area, it's a very beautiful bird on the water. It looks nice, it looks like a goose. The Barnegat Bay sneak box and the Barnegat Bay decoy, uh, as I have considered them, should be, con should be thought of in terms of the same development and the same maritime community that produced them. Both of these artifacts are lightweight and strong. We're noted for their strength. Both of these artifacts were designed in view of the Barnegat Expand. A sneak box is a 12-foot boat. Could be 14, 16, 18 foot, or it could be 10 foot, but it's built on the sneak box model. They're rounded on the bottom, and they won't cut in the ice, and you can sail them, you can row them. And they're a very able boat, one of the ablest for the size it's ever known. The sneak box was designed for one purpose only, and that is for to gun or to sneak up on ducks. It's the only boat that has a deck on it where you can put grass and stuff on it and float right in the ducks. It's a sneak box, and it was originated right here. This is Mary Hufford of the American Folklife Center interviewing Sam Hunt. How was it that you got started making sneak boxes? Well, I lived with a man that was a gunner. And in this town, Ware Town, it was all gunning. And there was, at one time, probably 20 or 30 sneak boxes here. And where they were built, I went to school, only three miles, Bonnie Gap. Uh -huh. And I was nights after school, when I got out of school, I used to go down to the shop because I knew all the men that worked there. And of course, when you're around in that, you watch and you look and you take notice of how everything is put together. Sam's position in the tradition of sneak box making is a rather unusual one. He's fond of telling of how people come from miles around just to talk with him and, and to learn about his sneak box making. And that's because the local people themselves recognize that he's rather a unique individual who 
is not so unique that he falls outside of tradition, but in fact is a connoisseur of all the traditions around here, that he is very unusual. Before you start to build a boat, you must have a jig. And that is the model. It can be a jig, can be the model or a shape of any so-called spung timber boat would be a jig. No matter whether it's 10 foot or 40 feet would be a jig. A jig consists of the shape of the boat, what you're going to build. Then you start and spring your stringing pieces around that what you spring your timbers over. That's the way you form the shape of the boat. The fern strips are not part of the snake box. After the timbers are sprung and put over them, the fern strips has no more use at all. They are cut, sawed, and taken out. This is a inside harpen. Now there's two of these, but this one is mortised out so the timbers goes in it, and the next one goes around and is fastened through this what the planking goes in, and they're all fastened together at the end. It's called a harpen, a main thing in any boat. Try again. How you go about bending the timbers, you have a steam box, a big steam box. And there's water in this pipe, and this water is heated. And the white oak timbers is already milled for the size that you want, and they're put in the box. And when they get boiled and steamed enough so that you can bend them pliable, then you take them out and you bend them in the spot where they go. In the original sneak boxes, they didn't steam no timbers. They used a sawed Jersey cedar frame, and they molded these frames out to a mold and then put spliced them together in the center. They all had the crown that they wanted for the size shape. Each timber was marked from one to 14. They was all marked to the spot that they went because each one of them was maybe a different contour. And But there was times when they sawed them all out to one contour. It all depended on the man who was building the boat. The stern of any boat is a transom. They are put in on different types and angles and different shapes. It all depends on the boat that you're building. Tell you what, just before I make that cut, I've got to make a trip here. I can't help it. This has to be done. But in these boats, they're put in on about 13 or 14 done. degrees on an angle. So that when there's any water in under it, it can't get above it. That goes in next to the harpen, of course, before the first plank goes on. I have a lot of different types of wood here, but mostly for boats, it's cedar and oak. When I have red cedar, I have white oak, I have the Jersey pine. Building boats, you must have tools to cut any shape or piece of wood that you're going to use or you can't build a boat. You can't go to a lumber yard and buy a piece of wood to put in the boat. Very, very seldom because they don't have it big enough or the shape, you have to shape every piece of wood that's put into a boat. I have a planer, it's an electric planer. I call it an equalizer because I can, I can take a piece of wood six inches thick and I can bring it down to a, an eighth of an inch if I want to. But I can make it any, any size, any thickness, any width that I want. And then if I have to bevel it, then I have to do that by hand on the side. The next step is to plank the boat. The way they're fitted are with a plane. You have to hand fit them and they have to be fitted into the time so that they're tight on the inside so there's what they call an airtight fit. There's that plank in the center and there's six plank goes on each side. There's 13 plank all together, but there's no law on that. You can put in 15 or you can put in 17 or you can put in uh, 20 if you want to, but if you get them too wide, you're apt to crack them, so it's better to narrow them down and let the seams take the contour of the shape of the hull. This has to be divided. The water's going between the plank. There's very little will go through there. If it gets damp, it wouldn't go through there, but if we use a corking cotton. 
You have to separate the cotton for the size of the seam, but the seam must be opened up first, and then the roller is tapered to fit into the seam. And then you must roll that in very evenly. And after that is put in, then the first thing you do is put a good linseed oil paint on it, and it will never leak. Push it in even. Now you got the boat plank, you turn the boat over, and then you start and put in your mast steps, your center board trunks, and and you you finish the top half of the boat. Every sailboat that sails must have a center board trunk into it. Actually, it's about eight or ten pieces of wood and put together so that ten or twelve inch board can go down through the center of it, and it has to be tight on each end. The trunk has to be made and shaped to the angle and the width of where it's going to go, and then it has to be fitted into the hull exactly where it's going to go. It down. The reason why you have to dry these in slow is it's copper. And if you drive a nail fast, you can almost pick it out with your fingers, but when you drive it slow, it'll hold three times as much. Get that out. The collins is the same as your timbers. The timbers in the bottom of the boat hold your plank, and the collins hold your deck on the top of your of your boat. And they are fastened into the inside harpen also, the same as your timbers. They've come together, one on one side of it, and one on the other. This is the shelf for to put gun shells and anything that you wish on there. And these things that hold fastened to are called codwads, and they are fastened to the deck collins. Then, of course, the deck goes on, and then the oil locks on both sides. I am lining up an oil lock so that the bolts that go through the top will go through the center of the collin, which is under, that fastens it to the boat. The oil locks is governed through an old Greek method, we'll say, 14 inches from the front of your seat to the center of the oil lock. That's a standard rule. And from the front of that seat is 14 inches is where the center of the oil lock wants to be. And the seat is up against the back end of the centerboard trunk, right where it belongs for you to row. Some people call it a spray curtain, but around here it is called a breakwater. It keeps the water out of the boat. When you're in a head sea or sailing, water runs off the deck and it don't run in the hull. It is a very necessity in the sneak box. You have to have one. It ain't a sneak box unless you got one of these on it. This is a decoy rack. What well, holds the decoys? Or any other thing that you wish to put on, but they must be removable. You have to unhook them. There's hooks comes on the side. You take the hooks out, and you take the piece, and you can put them down inside the boat, and you can cover the boat so you can't see them. What we have here is an example of the interplay between tradition and individual creativity. Folk artists are, do not strive for anonymity, as people often imagine. A folk artist must be anonymous. A, a ballad isn't a ballad unless we don't know who composed it. That's not true because people long to produce images of themselves and a sneak box in a sense is, is a portrait of the Barnegat Bayman. Now have you ever been out on the bay as the morning uncovers the day? Left in your mind magnificent signs And a feeling that faded away Now, 
Have you ever been out on the bay As the morning uncovered the day And left in your mind magnificent signs And a feeling that faded away The European tradition of wildfowling is extremely ancient, as you know. It goes back to ancient Egypt, to the wall paintings, and to Roman Greece. It involves the taking of waterfowl with traps, or seines, or nets, usually. By the 18th and 17th century, in England and Europe, they were using things called decoy cages, where the birds were trapped in these cages, being driven into the cages. Or they would be captured by dogs when the birds were molding in the spring. But in America, in the 19th century, a peculiar phenomenon developed, a wooden decoy. This is not to say there might not have been a wooden decoy here and there, but in a general use as a particular device to go after waterfowl, the wooden decoy was actually the, an American invention and an American tradition. The sporting gunner is a phenomenon that occurred in the 19th century, starting around the time of the Civil War. And it was with the uh, an increase in capital in terms of money and a lot of newly uh, made rich individuals that people turned to uh, uh, recreation in the uh, sense that we understand of going out and uh, hunting for wildfowl. And in uh, doing so, they would equip themselves with the, uh, the finest of decoys, the best Abercrombie and Fitch uh, apparel and, uh, and shotguns imported from England. And they would head out to resorts such as those in the uh, Barnegat Bay area, including the Tuckerton House, the Harvey House, and the Sunset Hotel. Well, a decoy is a historic artifact is basically a social tool. It was used not as an implement to lure birds, but as sort of a status statement. As one went to a resort hotel and got the finest guides, the finest sneak boxes, took the best equipment, that they would also get these birds that were made by the best carvers in the area. There was no real concern with the uh, decoy as art. It was rather on the carver's part, the most number of decoys that he could turn out with the uh, highest uh, quality. On the part of the hunter, it was the, uh, the finest decoys that money could buy. I've been making decoys uh, at least since I can remember, really. My father died when I was 12 years old. I remember sitting watching him make decoys, and I would carve a little along with him. That's so really been all my life. Well, I don't remember my grandfather, but he made a lot of decoys. He lived up in Tuckerton. He gunned, he, he market hunted for a living, made decoys, he peddled fish in the sun. I don't know how he did it, all he did, really. What I, the stories my aunt tells about him, but he must have really worked. And the decoys of his that are in collections today, he must have made a lot of decoys. Like, there's a lot of stories about uh, him making decoys. One is he'd go down and get a haircut in the barber chair, and while he was down there, he'd carve a head. And by the time the barber was finished giving him a haircut, he was finished the head. With the decoys that he made, he must have been, every spare minute of his time, I guess, was carving. The decoys I make are basically working decoys. They're decoys that could be used. Most of them today, people buy them for decoration, but they're really a working decoy. Uh, and they're what I think a duck looks like. I don't copy off of a real duck. I, and none of the old timers did, really. They, they hunted ducks, they sold ducks in the wild. They took the memory home with them. And you work from the memory and you come up with a nice decoy that you think is what it should look like. Today, the carvers are getting real ducks. They're getting them mounted, frozen, and they copy them feather for feather, really. It's really a model making instead of a carving. And it's a nice thing when it's done. It's a nice sculpture when it's finished. But I like art as a, put a little dream into it, a little, your imagination. In fact, paintings, I, I think a, a painting, if it's got a little, somebody's thought into it, it's better than if a guy copies something. Or when I'm making them for my, or just making a decoy to sell. And when I put the head on, I try to turn it to make it look that it suits me the best, which every one will be different, sideways or looking out. And I usually tilt it a little bit if it's looking sideways. 
if you ever noticed ducks or looked at ducks in a park somewhere, you know, and they make a funny noise, they'll kind of cock their head sideways and look at you. And uh, that's the way I get the head positions, really. For a decoy to be a good working decoy, it does have to look like a duck, it has to float like a duck. It has to act like a duck, really, in, in the water, the way it bounces around, swims around. I think you gotta have enough roundness to it that it'll rock a little bit, not too much, and it's gotta swim back and forth. It's, and it's gotta be weighted right so it sits the right uh, depth in the water. And uh, when a duck comes over, he sees that more than he would see the, the shape of the duck. You know, if it's realistic or not, he wants to see it at a distance of 100 yards and looks down and says, that's a nice flock of ducks down there. I'll go down and see what they're doing. I make a lot of decoys, but each decoy as it comes to be finished is an individual decoy. And I usually paint them one at a time. So that I'm not painting the whole, you know, I'm not mass producing decoys, in other words. I'm doing one at a time, and each one is an individual piece of carving. I hate to copy somebody else, even if it's in my family. I do my own thing, really. I make a duck the same way as my grandfather did, my father did. But as far as copying their style of carving or their patterns, I don't. I make my own duck. I think each one of them did, because you can tell them apart. You can tell my grandfather's duck, my father's duck, and you can tell my duck. In the factory made decoy, we take uh, the cedar, or pine, form it out basically into a blocks of wood, the shape of the bird. The blocks are taken over to a multi-spindle carving machine, set up in the carving machine. Dead center in the carving machine, there's a master. The body here is by Harry V. Shorge the, the first. The head here is by Harry V. Shorge the third. Okay, he picked up the decoy off of Harry V. Shorge the third. He took it apart, set it up on centers, after it's put up on centers, it's set up this way so it'll fit into the machine. We do copies of Harry V. Shorts, uh the third, and we do the grandfather, um, Harry V. Shorts again. Uh, our copies are drastically different, yet we do keep with the basic lines because it's part of Jersey history. We're proud of being able to do a copy, a fairly good copy of Harry Shorts without trying to rip off his name. The basic differences in ours are, again, uh, you could start right off with the choice of material. We use white pine a lot of times. Harry Shores, as far as I know, always used white cedar. The head seat, if you look at a Shores profile-wise, from the neck right wrapped around the breast down to the bottom of the bird, looks almost like a real super free flow on the Shores. Uh, ours is more of a, a slight angle in there, same with the from the throat to the breast of the bird. is. Now this is something that the novice eye wouldn't pick up, but they should be aware of it. Somebody comes in and say, I bought this Harry Shorts black duck for whatever, uh, $200 and this and that, and it's ours. If they ask our opinion of it, we'll tell them. We'll tell them it's ours and uh, the hell with whoever bought it off of us uh, because they're out to rip off the public. We're proud of Harry Shorts' name. We're not trying to make money off of it. We'll sell it honest, legit copy of the bird. But like I said again, there's drastic differences. The rig I put out today, we generally gone up the head of Barnegat Bay or right on down the bay to the inlet. But instead of just having the broad bill stools and canvas backs for the diving ducks. We put out the full rig where we have the geese, the brant, the black ducks. Now they gotta be upwind. 
and the broadbill stools are generally off a little bit further. Leave a little hole in the head of them and then drag the stools downwind. Each place would gun different, just like neighborhoods. People are different in each neighborhood. And like around Barnegat Bay, this is what they've done over hundreds of years. Now, Barnegat Bay stools are generally hollow. Maryland stools are generally solid. There's exceptions in all cases. But Barnegat Bay, they made the hollow stools because uh, like the sneak box you saw in mine today, people used to sail out with those sink boxes to go gunning and they had to get a lot of stools on and they couldn't have the weight the barnegat and the tuckerton area there was a lot of guides that took parties out that would come down from the city now these people had to have decoys so naturally every industry has to have somebody to supply so there's a man like harry shores who made thousands of decoys his decoys, he, he shipped to Maryland and Virginia. You find lots of them down there today because they were commercial makers. They made them for the guides, so the guides would have decoys. But these boys had pride in their work. And that, that's why this was there. This was their hand. And that's why you can tell their decoys. And you can tell one from the other just the way the man worked. I don't go to the bay to see if I can kill a wad of ducks or anything. I mostly go to the bay to take my decoys and my snake box, because that's just like going on a picnic to me. Sometimes you might see him towing his snake box on Barnegat Bay. After some black ducks he's going to eat on a cold winter's day, it's a beautiful way on Barnegat Bay, and it's a beautiful day out on Barnegat Bay. Sometimes you might see him towing his sneak box on Barnegat Bay. After some black ducks he's going to eat on a cold winter's day, it's a beautiful way on Barnegat Bay, and it's a beautiful day out on Barnegat Bay.